Hey, and welcome back to the Duke Wisdom Podcast. Back under some some weird circumstances in my apartment right now. It is not to, not to be a damper as we uh, starting things immediately, but man, it is ninety degrees in my apartment right now. This has been a sweltering day, just all day. Been walking around everywhere, and then I get back, and it is ninety degrees. Uh, while in here while I'm recording this podcast. Uh, so forgive me if my bra- brain waves are a little bit short or something. Uh, it's the heat getting to me. I definitely uh, want to talk about a little bit of a non-basketball thing to start things off, because how can you not talk about it when you talk about Duke athletics? Over the uh, long weekend on Labor Day, Duke pulls out its first top 10 victory since 1989 in football knocking off number nine Clemson 28 to seven. If you haven't already, you can go follow at Duke underscore wisdom FB on Twitter uh, slash X and be caught up on all new things. Duke football, Um, Duke wisdom is starting to put out articles. Shout out to Jordan Mann who put out the first uh, preview for a game for the Clemson game. And he's, I will have more pieces for football coming out as well, but I mean, what a statement for Mike Elko in that program Uh, in just year two and just game number 14 for Mike Elko at Duke. His his record is 10 and four in those first 14 games and knocking off a a top 10 opponent. There there can be some discourse about whether Clemson deserved to be a top 10 team in the country. And certainly people don't think so now after seeing them lose to Duke. They dropped to 25 in the most recent AP poll. But I think there's. There's a lot to be said about about Duke and what they're able to accomplish, what that defense was able to accomplish. You can you can blame you can try to blame it on just mind numbing errors from Clemson, you know, fumbling the ball in the red zone multiple times, having multiple kicks blocked. But that's that's defense, man. All credit to Mike Elko uh, in this team, and and this team's defense was just absolutely stellar. The only time Clemson scored was basically just off of Duke's own mistake. Uh, mishandling a uh, a punt and within Clemson's twenty yard line and just letting uh, at that point it was pretty easy for Clemson to get into the end zone. I mean, I say that as if they didn't fumble twice within ten yards in the second half. But great play from Riley Leonard. Um, great play. I mean, just I, you can't say enough about Duke's defense in that game. And just what a fantastic win for the brand. Duke heads into a three game stretch now: with Lafayette, Northwestern, and UConn. But ultimately, I think they should they should pull out three victories in those games. And then they'll head into Notre Dame in week five. And I think that's when you'll really see what this team's made of, how they handle another top 10 team in Notre Dame could prove just how good this Duke team really is. Uh, now ranked 21st, they're one of th- four ACC teams right now. Florida State's fourth, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Clemson at 25 and UNC at 17. It's the first time since 1994 that both Duke and Carolina are ranked at the same time in football. Want to join a community of Duke accounts publishing news, theories, and predictions on Duke athletics? Join the Duke Wisdom Network. Just go to dukewisdom.org slash join network today and fill out the form with your name and social media. Or you can DM at Duke underscore wisdom on Twitter or Instagram. Become a part of the community of Duke fans publishing their takes today. Again, that's dukewisdom.org slash join network or DM at Duke underscore wisdom on Twitter or Instagram. But let's talk about other football additions in the ACC. Let's talk about more ACC football. I promise this will transition into basketball. But so the ACC drops four games. ESPN put up a graphic. They said uh, talking about the ACC struggling in week one, which I think is a bit of a ludicrous claim to make four teams lost in the ACC, two of which were losing to other teams in the ACC, Clemson to Duke and also Louisville beat Georgia Tech. Those two losses were expected. Virginia got uh, beat pretty bad by Tennessee, but that's expected. You know, Virginia might be the worst team in the ACC. Tennessee's a fantastic team. So that's expected. There was only one loss that came unexpectedly for the ACC, and that was Boston College. Boston College losing 27 to 24. That one was the the biggest, like that shouldn't have happened. But you can't take Boston College losing and say that the ACC had a, a bad week one. I mean, that's that's insane to say when North Carolina 
revamped its defense considerably and ends up knocking off South Carolina by a pair of touchdowns. When Florida State plays number five LSU and manhandles them, when Duke knocks off top 10 ranked Clemson, a lot of good play from the ACC. Well, the ACC thinks that they they are here to stay in football, that they can they can elevate their play enough. And well, they tried to make a stab at that uh, last week by officially with the vote flip of NC State officially adding Stanford, California and SMU to the ACC effective next fall in 2024. Football wise, you know, I'm not sure what we're looking at immediately. Certainly a brand, certainly a brand for, for, for Stanford, certainly a brand for SMU being in Texas. But right now, Stanford and California might be two of the worst teams in the Pac-12 right now in football. Traditionally, that's not necessarily the case. Um, but right now, I don't know if they're adding exactly what they want football-wise. Oddly enough, the best thing that they're adding in any of these three teams program-wise is Stanford primarily in women's sports, but this move probably harms women's sports, actually. that All these women's sports programs are having to be moved because of a change that is, is being made almost exclusively for monetary and football reasoning. You know, and all these high-tier, high-quality women's programs, you know, that hurts them because a lot of these players aren't going to want to have to make these cross-country travels, and it could potentially harm these those really stellar programs. And that's a shame. I think there's a lot of people who have a problem with the geography of it. And obviously there is a problem with the geography of, of this move. Stanford, California, you know, both obviously being in the state of California is literally the exact by definition opposite of the Atlantic coast. (laughs) Some people have, you know, quirkily renamed it the all coast conference I kind of like that geography wise. It's I think it's unfair to the student athlete to make them travel like that cross country. Those games are going to be very difficult. And yes, they're going to be difficult for the existing ACC schools, making a trip to Stanford, making a trip to California, maybe even the trip to SMU as well. And those t- times for fans, those games, you know, look at basketball. You're going to be looking at uh, 11 p.m. tip time probably against Stanford or California. And that's tough. But it's way worse for Stanford. It's way worse for California. It's way worse for SMU. Those athletes are going to have to constantly be traveling to North Carolina, to South Carolina, to Florida, to New York, to Indiana. They're constantly making these cross-country trips. I mean, for almost every single road game they play. So this move, you know, was probably for for the betterment of financially for their athletics and especially for football. It's very, very difficult for athletes and programs at Stanford and California and SMU to pull this off. And I think that that's something that current ACC fans have to think about, that this this move is much more harmful for the teams moving in than it is for the teams that are already there. Basketball wise, what does this mean? I mean, I've already talked about what it means logistically, geographically. What does it do for the actual quality of play in the ACC? Well, there's another logistical thing, I suppose. Uh, The ACC, you play a 20 game slate in conference. That means, you know, you play with 18 teams. That means you're going to play 17 teams once, you know, straight up. And then you'll get three more games that will be double headers for Duke. That means North Carolina. No way that stops being a double header. Um, but Wake Forest likely does. Duke's played Wake Forest twice every year. Uh, the last time they didn't was 2010-2011. Um, so every year since 2010-2011, Duke has played Wake Forest twice. That's probably not going to happen anymore. Um, those other two doubleheaders every year will likely fluctuate. And I think you lose a little bit of regional rivalries. I mean, Duke was starting to get more doubleheaders with NC State. That likely happens very, very, very infrequently now with this uh, these additions. Quality of play-wise, Stanford probably hasn't really been good in 10 years. California probably hasn't been very good since they lost to Duke in the NCAA tournament in 2010, second round, and very good, I mean, like a nine seed. And SMU really in the last decade has had some decent teams against 
uh, less reputable competition. The only time they were like nationally really relevant uh, recently was when they had Shimmy Ojale on a roster. Um, to me, in SMU, you're gaining a team that's very similar to Boston College in stature. You're gaining a team that isn't going to provide a whole lot of competition unless things really change. I mean, the hope is that by adding these programs that their recruiting will increase, that you know fan interest will increase, and the programs, therefore, will get better. But if that's not the case, you're really adding a Boston College-level program basketball-wise in SMU. California literally was neck and neck with Louisville for the worst team in Power 5 last year. I don't expect that to be the case moving forward. A coaching change and everything should make things better at Berkeley, but I still don't know how confident I am that they can be kind of a powerhouse that makes any change. I think Stanford has easily the most promise basketball-wise, men's basketball-wise. I mean, women's basketball, of course, Stanford's going to be a huge addition to the ACC. But men's basketball-wise, that's going to be a work in progress. I think Stanford can get to a place where they, they're competing and they're making the NCAA tournament in the ACC and that they're bolstering everybody else's resume. That time isn't necessarily right now, though. Um, I, I, you know, and I touched on it. I do think that Stanford is a big addition for women's sports. I don't think that's something that I want to slide past. You know, I, that I want, I want to really talk about that because yes, it doesn't make a lot of sense for the two main revenue sports in football and men's basketball at the moment. They could, especially Stanford could, and California really too. SMU makes less sense. It's primarily just a football pick. Um, but women's athletics-wise, Stanford is fantastic, and so many women's athletic, uh, women's athletics. But in women's basketball, you talk about a team that's been a one seed you know, multiple times in the recent past, and – will be competing right there with programs like NC State, programs like Louisville um, for prominence in ACC women's basketball. Duke's on the up up and up with Kara Lawson, the three seed last season. Um, North Carolina's been good over the last few years in women's basketball. And Stanford adds a big dynamic to ACC women's basketball. And I think that that's a huge addition for women's athletics and the ACC. But I do want to say that I think the ACC, if they were going to do an expansion like this, I think it had to ha- an expansion had to happen to try to keep up with the Big Ten and the SEC. It had to happen. You can say they didn't need to do this. They had to do something. But I'm going to say that they should have been more aggressive about additions earlier and tried to add different, more substantial teams than they did. Because now they're just sort of left with what the leftovers of the Pac-12. It's difficult to call Stanford and California that, especially because Stanford and California meet the the merit and the criteria of the ACC. They fit the bill of an ACC school that's just, you know, 2,000 miles away. They are solid, really good, actually fantastic academic caliber schools uh, with some very credible and solid athletic programs. I think SMU less fits the mold than they do. And to me is a very curious pick. If you told me 10 years ago SMU would be in the ACC, I would have called you a liar straight to your face. Here we are. <laughs> but um, it's it's difficult to imagine the ACC with Stanford, California, and SMU right now. But it'll seem more normal for fans, you know, in five years. But for people who work within these these programs and for the athletes, I don't think there's anything normal about it. And making a cross-country trip in college athletics should not be something that happens this frequently because that's going to cause athletes to miss classes. That's going to cause athletes' lives. And student, the life of a student athlete is always already so busy, already so difficult. It's only going to add a extra extra layer of difficulty that's just not necessary. And so I think that this is an unfortunate move. I think the ACC should have acted quicker to try to add somebody. I mean, SMU distance is unfortunate, but to stay in that realm, because going out to California is just, that's rough. It's rough for the student athlete and programs and schools who will say that, you know, they feel for the student athlete, but they voted yes to add these teams, man. They say it's about the student athlete, but they voted for this move. And so you have to question that. You have to 
well, you do question it and you know that, that they're, you know, that they're exaggerating the truth a bit because the main concern was always money, always was money, always will be money. Um, and that's unfortunate. I think that's really unfortunate. And I think this move wasn't really a basketball move. I think is for the ACC, ACC is a basketball conference. You'd like to see more of a basketball move. I, you know, as intriguing as it would have been to have added a Villanova, or even if you're going to the West Coast to Gonzaga, financially, football-wise, it doesn't make sense <laughs> to go after schools with, you know, who can't add anything for football. And I think it's going to be hard to wrap my head around this as these schools start playing. Um, I'll get used to it. Will the players get used to it? That's the question. That's really the question. And the biggest other question is, will this make the difference? Will this bring about enough financial incentive for the three dissenting voters of Florida State, Clemson, and North Carolina to stick around? Because if they don't, this was pretty much for nothing. Because if those three schools still bolt, you've lost your football capital. You've still got an okay basketball conference, but... You've, Duke's just lost its rival. You've just lost one of your colossal basketball programs in North Carolina if they end up bolting. And then, you know, where are we? And then you've basically just caused Stanford, California, and SMU student-athletes a lot of turmoil for no reason in a, in a desperate gas, grasping of straws. I, again, it's a move that had to happen. It's a move that needed to happen if the ACC wanted to keep up. But there are just there's a lot of unfortunate confounding things going on alongside the decision to make this expansion, because you can't you have to view it from all angles. Man, I'm out here talking about expansion in the 90, 90 degree apartment. Uh, this is going to be a shorter episode, man. Uh, been listening to myself talk for these this past <laughs> this past however many weeks now, um, and I'm really hopeful next week or at least the week after to have guests on here and have somebody that I can talk with and give you guys more of a conversation. So uh, I'm glad that for all the, um, so happy about all the positive feedback I've received, but uh, you know, I'm just here talking to myself basically and ranting about something while I'm, you know, beads of sweat are running down my face right now in the 90 degree heat. I'd like to know what you guys think about expansion. Please tweet at Duke wisdom. Let me know. I know I've already sent out some, some tweets about it. Uh, I'd love to write a story about it, go more in depth about the details. Cause right now this is off the top of my head and uh, a little bit of a limited understanding. And I think that's what I really want to line up is that my understanding of this whole scenario is not as flushed out as it could be. And I think that it should be. And before I write anything, obviously I will do my due diligence and do my research before I put anything like that out here. I, I'm not claiming to be an expert about this right now. There, there are certain things on this podcast that I'm closer to being an expert about. This is not one of them at the moment, but it is new. It is fresh. And it is something that I want to air my opinion, my gut reaction opinion about before I go into, you know, a more well-researched, potentially flexible perspective on this as i'm sure i will adapt in the near future but that's that's the talk on expansion uh man i really want to do a trivia episode uh maybe get some guys on to talk about football it is the duke basketball it is the duke wisdom basketball podcast though so i don't know i'm gonna limit the amount i talk about duke football but you had i had to mention the electric win from monday night um you can't talk duke athletics right now without talking about that um as always, man, thank you guys for listening. I'm so lucky that I that I have people that want to listen to this and care to hear about my opinion about anything. And so that's that's a very, very nice position to be in. Um, so thank you guys so much for listening. Thank you so much for following me on, on social media. And be sure if you're not already to follow on Twitter at Duke underscore wisdom, same handle on Instagram, on threads. Uh, you can subscribe on YouTube and find this podcast there as well. And make sure to subscribe or follow the podcast wherever you're listening. Thanks so much, guys. And I'll talk to you next week.